are you today, Melanie? I'm doing great. Thank you, Bob. So Melanie, I've known you lots of years. You've done some really nice things. You've got clients that really love you. And <clears throat> it's a pleasure to speak with you and, and learn a little bit, take a little bit of a deeper dive with one of your clients just to get a feel for the way you think and what you offer your clients and so forth. So do you want to, um, for people that don't know you, do you want to give a quick background about you and about your marketing and so forth? Sure. Uh, so I have been in the media industry for over 30 years now. I have done work in a um, variety of industries, primarily on the agency side, but also spent quite a bit of time on the um, corporate side. Uh, started out kind of in the packaged goods area, then started to um, delve into other, uh, other categories. And for the most, um, the most uh, part, my, the, my career has been primarily focused on B2B and technology and um, just a, a variety of categories within um, the B2B space globally. Uh, I've worked, well, I won't go into details, but um, across the media channels, both traditional media and digital media, and really with a special emphasis on strategy. Excellent. And um, so what's the, what's the difference between um, like uh, media, account, uh, media marketing and and advertising? Media, marketing, and advertising. Well, I think of marketing as the broadest in the, um, in those three, within those three subjects. Uh, marketing has many pillars, many um, legs to it. Within marketing, advertising is one of the legs in my mind. Yeah. And so marketing is more of the more strategic and the, all the overview and everything and, and the Advertising is more of the specific outreach um, on certain mediums, the media mediums and so forth. Exactly. And, and it, did it, sound, it sounded like you had a, a taste of some B2C as well with, with the consumer goods, or was that more B2B as well? I've done a lot of B2C, not just consumer goods, but also financial services, um, healthcare, just a variety of categories. Yeah, but the, mo the majority of my career has been in the business. And, and, and from your perspective, how does B2B compare to B2C? What, what are some of the differences? Uh, there's a lot, actually. Uh, I think there's a lot of similar, similarities and also a lot of differences. In terms of the differences, I think I, I'm fascinated by the B2B industry because I think that um, selling to a consumer versus selling to a business uh, can be very different. I think um, when you're looking at a decision, um, to take an action or buy a product or sign up for something um, in the business world, you're really focusing more on um, your the entire organization, not just what the needs are for yourself. Whereas if you're deciding whether you want to buy um, a can of soup, <laughs> for instance, <laughs> it's about yourself, it's about your family, yes, but it's a much it's a much bigger play when you're talking about your entire organization and, and also your how you fit in functionally within that organization. Sure. Lots of people to lots of people to hit from different angles. And Melanie, when you think about creating a campaign for a client, how do you first get your ideas and how do you first conceptualize what needs to be done? Uh, well, uh, we or I <laughs> have always taken a very methodical ap approach. Um, I used to teach um, used to teach media 101 classes at the Clorox company, and um, in that role, um, I worked with um, my supervisors at the time to develop a methodology. We called it the OSTG method, and the OSTG method really uh, starts from um, well, the O stands for objectives, S stands for strategy, uh, T stands for targets, and G stands for goals. So when we, I or we as in my agency, uh, begin a campaign, first we like to get as much of that information from our clients as possible so that we don't um, get anything started without fully understanding their business, their marketplace, what they're looking to achieve, and how they are looking to take their uh, advertising dollars and make them work harder for them. So when I so when we go into this 
um, this planning process, there's an, probably the bigger part of the work is done up front, doing research on the media landscape, the target audience, the buying funnel, uh, what is the typical day like in our target audience's life, and how can we align what those target objectives and audiences are with the media that we would consider for the plan. We don't actually start rolling up our sleeves and working on a media plan until the client has bought off on all of these uh, pre-planning objectives and strategies and targets. When you talk about doing research, do you, uh, is that customer interviews? Is that surveys? Is that keyword research? Is it all of the above? Is that, like, how do you do, how do you really delve in and understand that their customers? Of the variety of ways, we look at syndicated research around the audiences, the targets, um, what media they're consuming. We look at um, special reports. Sometimes there'll be surveys done, for instance, a CFO survey. What are CFOs buying or what, is, what media are they um, looking at? We do old school Google uh, searches. What media, um, industry media, publications are out there to reach construction workers or human resource professionals. I actually sometimes talk to people I know in the industry, but I, I'm very careful about not relying a lot on what one person says. I'm actually, I actually happen to be married to someone who's in IT. So <laughs> I have picked his brain about certain IT uh, categories, but I never take that um, you know, too far because you know, he's one person out of um, a larger universe. So I try, to re I try to look at research where there's a large sample size and where I can get some good, um, reliable data before I, I make any kind of. And we also look at competitive research. What are the client's competitors doing? Um, where does the client stand um, in their position in the market compared to their competitors? And what are they trying to do? Do they have enough budget to really stand out and create a larger share of voice? Or are we talking about you know, creating a smaller splash within a, um, a specific target universe. And I know you did recently, uh, you know, pre presented a case study that had some incredible performance. Can you talk about how you, how you thought about that and how that came to, came to be? Sure. Uh, so that study that your case study that you're referencing, Sean, um, was in the human resource industry, um, the audience um, that we were going after um, was very, um, pretty much um, across the board in terms of the size of the organization, but really just looking at HR, human resource professionals, executives, focusing a lot on the C-suite, and also you know, going kind of um, broader in terms of senior level uh, titles. So uh, one of the things that we did was, as I mentioned earlier, was um, besides the fact that we've done a lot of work in the HR space that so we kind of already knew what some of the large publications were out there, we wanted to also find some additional media properties. Where else can we go to expand? Plus, we were looking into global regions such as uh, the UK, looking for um, HR publications that are um, top-notch within um, the EMEA region as well as North America. So outside of doing uh, Google searches and looking at past performance of other clients in the HR space, which we rely on heavily, just having that breadth and depth of knowledge in specific categories, uh, we also um, look at, um, from, a, from a media perspective, what um, channels are um, being used more heavily by this audience. And what was the, maybe you can't speak to this, but what was the goal of the, of the client? Was it to, well, maybe just speak to the, to the goal of the client, if you can. Sure. Oh, yeah, sure. So it's a demand generation team. So the goal is, is or was to, it's an existing client, <laughs> um, is, was to, is to generate uh, leads that convert to sales pipeline, opportunities in sales pipeline and drive to um, revenue. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. And can you, I mean, I don't want to brag for you. I think the performance was pretty outstanding. Can you, can you talk about that? Uh, oh yeah, for sure. Uh, so we started with this client in September and uh, after about four months, uh, we recorded uh, performance, we received performance 
data from them that we had um, exceeded ROI, that we had hit an ROI of nine times over media spend in terms of influence pipeline. And outside of that, um, we also uh, tested across a couple different channels um, and regionally glo we, we um, targeted global, uh, both uh, North America and EMEA. Now they're, um, they're since going to be doubling their budget. That's extraordinary. Thank you. <laughs> and I know that you, as part of this, I believe you use content syndication. Can you, for, for those unfamiliar, can you talk about that? Because I know it's a way of getting content in front of clients that maybe, or in front of prospects that maybe you wouldn't be able to otherwise. Oh, sure. Um, so content syndication is a top of funnel media channel really looking to get the client's uh, content, whether it be white papers, case studies, um, on-demand webinars, special reports, eBooks, you have it, um, and putting those into the um, hands of prospective customers using a variety of targeting techniques. Uh, we look at everything from um, job title, I mean, traditional job titles, company size, industry targeting, and also layering on buyer intent, which is basically looking at the top keywords that are um, most applicable to the client's products and solutions. What are the topics that are, uh, that are, being, um, that are being searched on or I guess um, engaged with online? Um, so the keywords are a big part of the mix, and the idea of the keywords is to, are to um, prioritize who we go after. We also use target accounts. Target accounts are a big part of our ABM strategy. We look at both the client's um, existing target accounts as well as lookalike accounts. Lookalike accounts being taking those accounts and finding similar accounts using the media partner's AI technology to fi find out which, uh, which additional companies are also surging on their top keyword topics. And also have the other firmographic um, characteristics as the um, target that the client. And you had a really seemingly unique marketing mix. How did you, how did you come up with that? Was that something you did was unique to this client or is it something that's more common with the work that you did? Uh, the, the marketing mix or media channel mix is going to really um, ladder up to what the client's objectives are and what their budgets are. Because this client had a lead generation or demand generation objective and was not looking to um, generate awareness with this program uh, and they had a separate program for awareness which is separate from this program. Um, we were we looked at media channels that have traditionally delivered for us in the um, the demand generation space. We've also looked at programs that we've run against the human resource audience. Um, email seems to to do well. We did a lot of dedicated email um, towards those um, targets using selects that were specific to the titles and the geography and just the contextual environment that um, those HR professionals are, are in online. So, so we chose, the, the, the mix that we chose was um, the top of the funnel content syndication and um, dedicated email to really help drive the messaging. So it sounds like what really drives for you, your performance is just a, a deep, deep, experience and professionalism that that you bring to sort of a client engagement is that would you say that that's sort of you know true i mean obviously you have you said you had 30 years of this it seems like that that you've seen you've seen a ton of it what what do you think is what do you think is on the horizon what do you think is new what is was exciting about um things that you're seeing now because i know you did a lookalike audience with artificial intelligence and that's um, obviously with the, with, the, with the platforms of AI, but what are you seeing now that's exciting you? If anything, because I mean, obviously you've had, you said, like you said, you've, you've, you have deep experience with it. 
Oh, thank you. Um, well, I think um, the lookalike in buyer intent has been around for a while. I think what I'm going to see, what I what I believe is going to be coming on the horizon, it's kind of hard to say, but um, you know, the world is changing. We're not. Um, Ball. We're not out in our cars as much anymore because of the pandemic. We're not going to trade shows. We're seeing a lot of media come online because people can't be in person as much. Hopefully that's going to change again for corporations and they'll be able to get out there and handshake you know, their, their prospects, which is really important to the, the business funnel. Um, but from a media perspective specifically, I think there's definitely some saturation going on. I, I think, you know, Webinars, for instance, were really big back in the day, but now there's just so many. I think we need something new and different. I think we need to find a way to, um, to really better drive, uh, better, better, um, better reach our audiences without so much waste and also um, really kind of making our dollars work harder for us. What are the channels that are going to do that? I think it's always going to be very individualized. I'm very individualized with every media plan that I do or that we do as our agency. Um, I don't think there's an answer for every client that's going to be the same. Um, I, in terms of what's coming down the pike, I mean, I, I really I don't have anything specific. I think the, the um, fact that the, the – um, cookie is going away is kind of a big thing in the industry right now. So we really need to figure out ways to try to find users online and, um, and remarket to them. And if we can't cookie them, then it that, that job becomes much harder. <laughs> so, so we really have to. I think I like the way you think about, you know, looking at what are the behaviors, what are the, um, what are the triggers that people have, and where can we find them online. So part of the job of a media professional is to align with the creative professional and, and the business um, leader, who the you know is the client in this sense, really come together and figure out how can we take the dollars and do the right thing so that we can make the action that we want happen. And so the more that we can really pinpoint what are the uh, characteristics of our audience and where are they and when are they and how can we reach them in a polite fashion. People don't like pop-ups. People don't like to be, um, you know, um, marketed to per se. I think the softer advertising works. I've heard that humor works. I like the idea even of B2B clients, you know, it can be fun. It can be sexy. It can be interesting. It doesn't have to be boring, <laughs> you know, but, um, but that, that's what I'd like to see is I'd like to see some of the, the creative get just more, more interesting and fun and some of the um, some of the new technologies that we can use now with you know obviously we've had video for a while but video is always a fun way to to, to express a brand and you know looking at sequencing ad sequencing you know how we can get get a user down the path from you know starting with the, you know maybe a thought leadership message and then um, taking them into different um, different thought patterns so they get to the point where they're they're ready to to pick you know, ready to Speak to a salesperson, get a meeting, you know, what can we do to, to get them interested and get them on board? A lot of my clients like to just focus on lead generation, and I am constantly trying to, to get them to do, do more, more um, mid and top of funnel media, such as uh, some of the awareness, um, awareness media and, um, you know, something outside of that tradition. And you mentioned, I mean, that was really rich. I mean, I have like now a bunch of questions, but you know, one of the things you talked about was that team of you, the media planner, the business lead, if, if that's, you know, if that's, if there's one and then the creative, how have you seen that team work well together? How have you seen that team not work well together? And, and, um, you know, in, in your role, what is, what is, what is ideal? If, if I'm, if I'm a client coming to you, what is ideal in terms of how I relate to you? Well, I really like it when the media and the creative team have a little powwow at the very beginning. I'd like, I'd like even the analytics team, so getting everybody involved in the kickoff so that 
and this happens more at larger agencies, so that the media doesn't go off in one, one, um, one path and the creative doesn't go off in one path. And they all ultimately have to answer to the client. So the briefing is happening in silos. The client is briefing the creative team, the client is briefing the media team, and the media is working with the analytics team. Ideally, they all get briefed together. I think that, that would be ideal so that everybody is go, working towards the same objective. Consolidated brief, it's a consolidated kickoff call. Then they go off their separate ways. Then somewhere in the middle they meet and they talk again about where they are and are we going in the right direction? Are things still kind of aligning? And this is more for larger, larger clients where they have, you know, bigger, bigger investments. More silos too. Yeah, exactly. Hope that helped. <laughs> yeah, and so in terms of in terms of where you've seen failures, um, you're talking about that failure being really a failure of everybody sort of doing their own thing and then at the end trying to come together and not and there's just a mis mismatch. Is that is that fair? I mean, yes, it's happened um, many times in my career. And what ends up happening is the creative has to be revised or the media has to be revised. And um, ultimately, I like it when clients say to me, the media is going to drive the creative because then I have like, you know, everything goes. You know, I can make a recommendation that ideally the creative will support. Um, but I think ultimately it's got to portray the message. So every media brief that I put together, I make sure the client, I ask the client to give me an idea of their creative strategy. What are they looking to, what are they looking to communicate with their advertising? Not just how much do they want to spend and where do they want to spend it. It's, it's also what is, the, what is the message and what is the priority. And how, you know, every, every medium has I wouldn't say an optimized or ideal sort of creative, but how do you how do you make sure that the creative stays relevant to the medium, you know, going forward and over time as you're getting feedback? I don't know why I emphasize uh, feedback like that, but you know what I mean. It's sort of like as you're getting as you're getting feedback, how do you sort of you know how do you make decisions about how the creative should it change? Because you're also making, I would presume, decisions about how your media is changing. And you know, you might have a false negative about the media because it just the creative wasn't right for that medium, um, or vice versa. How much testing are you doing? How much how how are you interpreting those analytics to to make that really pretty sophisticated multivariate decision? Right. Um, I think ultimately starts with which creative does the media um, offer? Like what creative works with, with that channel? What creative has worked in the past with that channel? What are the KPIs? What are the objectives? Um, once we do get a program going, um, we are very rigorous about evaluating the metrics along the way and optimizing the campaigns. Um, according to you know, media format, basically all the campaign elements um, when we get when we get um, feedback, you know the metrics. Metrics sometimes take some time to develop because we have to have enough data to work with. So if we're looking at a conversion metric, we have to have enough impressions and clicks or view throughs and conversions to be able to start optimizing our plan. Some clients like to go in and optimize right away. We like to give it time just to make sure we have enough data to work with. Um, to answer your question about how do we align the creative and the media from a planning and strategy standpoint? I think beyond just historical performance, I think it also has to do with, again, what is the creative message? Is the creative message um, more brand focused or is it more direct response focused? And so some of the elements that are going to be more inclined to drive whatever that response is, is going to, is going to be influenced by the format and the, and the and the media channel and kind of how they work together. That's that's fascinating. I, I imagine it being a very delicate balance in terms of, you know, making adjustments and not over correct over correcting for, for your clients. 
Um, and each, I would think each vertical is, is pretty different. HR versus CPG or whatever. Yeah, it is very different. And also, um, I, I don't want to lose sight of your point, Sean, which was really good, which is that um, how do we ensure that it's not the creative driving the media performance and the media driving the creative performance? Because at the end of the day, all the factors are going to be influencing what the outcome is. So one of the things we like to do when we set up a test is that we apple, keep things apples to apples. And if we're going to test specific creative formats, we try to test them equally across the media partners and across the channels where possible, just so we do have that sort of even layer of testing. But sometimes the plan doesn't call for that. Sometimes it just a certain format in a certain channel just because not either it's not available or it just, you know, doesn't perform. And how do you so I don't want to take up too much time. I know that we're, we're running a little bit tight on time, but I, I could sort of be asking questions forever. So Bob Rear will be in, but my, I think, you know, to respect your time, I think my last question is how, like, how do you know when to, uh, and I know this is a very Silicon Valley term, how do you know when to pivot your media plan? How do you know when it's just, it's just been the wrong allocation and now it's time to sort of change? Funny, we just had that situation in one of our <laughs> programs. Uh, it's really about just evaluating the performance along the way, looking at reporting, meeting with the client weekly or biweekly in some cases to evaluate how the programs are doing, not only from our perspective, the front end, but how are they, from a B2B perspective, how are the salespeople that are calling on the leads that we're delivering, how are they... Um, responding to what they're getting from the program. Are they seeing you know, initially good titles? Are they seeing initially good um, companies? Are, you know, are they feeling good about the program? So just really keeping that sort of 360 degree feedback loop with the client and also just touching the campaign. Once we have a campaign completed and in market, that's when a lot of the work starts is when we really start to evaluate and optimize. And if we see a partner is not delivering, either they're not they're they're underpacing or um, from a display standpoint, you know, the click-through rates are bad or the conversion rates are bad or whatever we're looking at specifically from a KPI perspective. Then we'll go in and um, try to work with the current partner and see if we can improve it first because we just want to give it out and see if we can um, turn it around. But if it's really bad, you know, we'll just pull the money and, you know, put it either to a current existing partner that's doing really well or, or, or platform, for instance, or because we've moved money from like display to paid social, you know, so we, we move money however, however it, it, it needs to be moved just to hit the client's success metric. I have a couple of questions, but good question, Sean. Um, so, so one is I noticed, so you're, you're doing a double touch on this HR campaign and um, I like that. So have you, have you, do you know what the uplift is on a double touch versus a single touch as far as the, in, um, how much the person's engaged when they, when they come in? You know, I've seen it work um, well for us and I've seen it not work well for us. The general, um, my general response is I don't have specific metrics on that, but I can tell you um, briefly that when a client takes a double touch campaign and immediately sends those leads to sales to call on, that's gonna fail. It's still gotta go through a drip, drip nurture. All content syndication in my mind is top of funnel and it's always gotta go through some type of drip nurture before it goes to sales or else it's gonna fail. And I've had a client who took a double touch and immediately started direct dialing and it was a failure. Luckily we caught it early on and we pivoted, great term, we pivoted it <laughs> quickly <laughs> and turned it around. But yeah, that's a good question, Bob. I like that question. I yeah, don't have metrics, know. unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. And I've seen some, you know, cause you know, the, it sounds like this one was both touches were, were digital, right? Email or, or, uh, or some other digital as opposed to email and telly, for instance. Um, um, I've done double touch. Oh, sorry to cut you off. I've done two touch both ways. 
um, well, three ways, really. I'm currently doing um, email and teletouch. I'm also doing an, an email and a display touch. Yeah. I know you know the client. <laughs> and then <laughs> the third one I'm doing is two, two, two digital touches. Oh, yeah. and, and either way, under, under all the circumstances, it requires more nurturing by the client before it goes to sales. There's oh, no yeah, way around yeah. that. Yeah. And then the other question I have is, so HR, I'm assuming it's HR systems of some sort, HR, uh, IS. So trying to reach out to both HR people and, and maybe tech people as well. And is the messaging different to the different uh, personas at the target audience? Um, it's less about tech with this client and more about um, strategy, management strategy. It's HR around yeah. um, talent and patient and surveys, that sort of thing. So yeah, I mean, definitely, so we don't really have a technology title filter. It's more about C-level executives, strategic HR, and also HR practitioners when it comes Got it. Okay, beautiful. Um, Sean, do you have any other questions? Um, otherwise, it's, uh, do, Melanie, do you have some extra words of wisdom for us before we let you go? Uh, well, thank you for having me, and um, I hope that I made sense. Uh, and I, um, I guess my only thing to say to part is that um, I have an absolute passion for media, and um, I would love to be able to share it with people um, you know, that are, you know, what, because one thing I'd love to do is I'd love to be able to teach college level. I just can't mm -hmm. stop doing what I'm doing now because <laughs> I like it too much, but, um, and I love my clients and my vendors. I have to say vendors are probably my, my favorite. I love working with the media partner. Being a good one, Bob. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. John, anything else? I, I'm really appreciative of your time. I mean, a lot of great insights. I learned, I learned so much talking to you. So I'm really grateful for you and your time and excited about your success. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for your support. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you both. And I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Take okay. care. Take care. Have a great weekend. <laughs> right. Thank you. Bye.